Okay, so now that we're back and we've looked at that example, we've seen that the, uh, the easier way for us going forward is to try to value stock using the direct method. In other words, we are going to try to value shares and we're going to find it uh, easier and uh, in, in many ways more efficient to try to value company shares directly by valuing them based on their own cash flows. And we talked about those cash flows in that example, right? The, uh, a share of stock or, or a shareholder, an owner of a share of stock, uh, can receive cash flows from that stock in two different ways. The first way being dividends, right? The, part of the rights conferred on a shareholder um, by the company is a proportional share in the profits of the firm and that share comes in the form of a dividend. Okay, so a dividend is, your, is the owner's share of the company's profits, and those cash flows are paid to shareholders regularly. Uh, and then the, uh, the other way that a shareholder can receive cash is by selling the stock. Right? So ultimately, they can receive the value of the stock at some point in the future for whatever that is uh, by selling it at that point. And whatever the value of that stock is at that point in the future, is going to be the present value of all the remaining dividends in, from that point on into the future. Okay, so uh, a lot of a lot of what we're going to be talking about when we talk about valuation is prediction and about future concepts. Right, so uh, there is going to be uh, a lot to wrap your head around here. So remember that all what we're talking about here is uh, taking the present value of future cash flows. Okay, now. Uh, I told you that I have, I'll show you some examples of, of how this uh, is a better um, or is a maybe a more reliable way to value stock than uh, by trying to value companies. And the reason it's more reliable is because it does tend to be the case that dividends are paid out in a more um, uh, constant fashion. So dividends are paid out on a regular basis. They also tend to have a strong... Um, sense of uh, impetus behind them. In other words, uh, shareholders, owners in, of the firm and the stock market in general tends to put a lot of stock into companies that pay dividends and, to how to, and into how those dividends are paid out. And they tend to put a lot of stock into the fact that the dividends are relatively constant and that they grow at a relatively constant rate. Okay? So shareholders don't like to see big swings, big changes in dividends, and managers recognizing that fact attempt not to do it, right? So we rarely see dividends get paid out in big jerking motions where one quarter it's a dollar and the next quarter it's 10 cents and the next quarter it's a dollar again. Because the only in way for shareholders to interpret that, that payout uh, pattern is to say that in the second quarter the firm had really bad performance. And if that was what you thought, and that was how you were basing your predictions upon the future going forward, you would might be inclined to sell a stock or maybe uh, to try and get the manager replaced or something like that. So there is a strong incentive from the manager's point of view to continue to pay out dividends and to continue to pay them out at an increasing rate, because that demonstrates to the owners of the firm, not only that you're reliable, but also that you are continuing to generate more value, because the only way you can keep paying out or reliably keep paying out a higher dividend every every period is by generating more and more profit. And that's exactly what a shareholder wants to see. And so the fact that it's unlikely for a firm to have relatively stable cash flows like that doesn't mean that it's unlikely for a firm to have relatively stable dividends. And that's because the dividend is chosen by the firm. It's not the entirety of the firm's profit. It's only a piece of the firm's profit the piece that isn't given to retained earnings. And so the dividends can be chosen specifically so that they generate a nice stable pattern that's reliable sense of set of cash flows for the firm. And actually, this is not that uncommon. Uh, there are even a set of stocks that are called dividend aristocrats that have been generating and paying an increasing, steadily increasing dividend every period for more than 50 years. And I'll show you here an example of Procter & Gamble, which is a big uh, consumer company. Uh, we can look at their dividend history. So uh, most big companies have a section on their website where you can go and look at their, uh, their financials, their, um, 
uh, they call it like investor information. This is something that they're sort of required to report by the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, which is the regulator for companies in the U.S. Uh, uh, so here's the dividend information for um, uh, uh, Procter and Gamble, and notice that right up at the top, they talk about their commitment to increasing their dividends over time. They've been paying dividends for 130 years, and over the last 64 years, they have increased steadily increased their dividend at a steady rate, uh, and they've done that consistently for 64 years. Right, every quarter they've paid out an increasing rate. And you can look at the dividends that they're paying out here. Oh, this is just the last 10 years from 2010 to 2020. And they, it's increased from $1.80 to uh, 3 dollars And notice that that's a pretty steady increase over 10 years. And that's 10 years is not even the beginning. This is 64 years. And so they report, they list their dividend, not for 64 years, but for the last 40 or so. And you can see, if you look at them, that they slowly grow and they grow at a pretty constant rate. So they go from four cents to a nickel, and then six cents, and then seven cents, and eight cents, and nine cents, and 11, 12, 15 cents, 20 cents, and a quarter, 35 cents. And over time, they are slowly growing until they are paying their latest dividend in July. Uh, 23, they were paying 79 cents on their quarterly dividend, which is this $3 figure, because that's the, the annual dividend that they're paying, right? So they're paying that out for every share, right? And Procter & Gamble's not the only one. So it turns out, actually, that there are quite a few firms and that this is much more common for firms to have a sort of reliably stable growing dividend. And in fact, that it's an, managers have an incentive to continue to do it that way. Uh, to keep shareholders happy. So this makes it a really uh, reliable way for us to calculate value. It's going to be much more difficult, you'll see in later chapters, to try and value companies, specifically companies from a direct method, because their cash flows aren't as reliably stable. There isn't a way for managers to manage those kind of cash flows as directly. Okay. So, uh, the, the mathematics that we're going to use here, uh, we've already talked about in that example. There are nothing that we don't know already. We're going to use a, um, a perpetuity formula. We're going to have a growing perpetuity model because we have growing, steadily growing cash flows for an indeterminate length of time, right? It is going to, it is, it turns out mathematically to be better for us, a, a better estimate of value to assume that the value that the cash flows go on forever, which we know isn't true, than to try and pick a date that the firm will end in advance, right? So we might say, okay, most firms don't live longer than 50 years. So we'll say that, uh, you know, any firm we value is only at most gonna be uh, 50 years old. The problem is, is that we are gonna get that wildly wrong. We're gonna get it just as wrong as if we assumed it went on forever. And actually the math is kinder to us if we do assume it goes on forever. So we are going to use the, the, div, uh, the, uh, the growing perpetuity model in order to take the present value of all the dividends and add them together. And the reason why I need this, of course, is because we can't take the present value of all the dividends one by one. There's an infinite number of these dividends, and we simply can't take an infinite number of math problems. Uh, we can't do it anywhere. So we're going to use the uh, availability of mathematics uh, and the nice uh, and the nice thing is is that the, the that we have the option to do this, and it's the uh, present value of the uh, of a growing perpetuity. So the question for us is, how do we think about these future cash flows? How do we think about these future dividends? And we think about at least within the context of the math that we have in this class, there's only going to be three three types of dividend, what we call dividend regimes. Uh, that we are going to be able to use in order to calculate the value of a stock. Okay? So a firm that pays dividends that have no consistent pattern, that go from a dollar to two dollars to 50 cents back to two dollars, we have no way to value that within the confines of, the, of what we know in this class. There are ways to value a company like that. We just aren't going to learn them. Okay? So what we're going to learn is how to value a company that, like Procter & Gamble, has a relatively stable pattern of dividend payments. And there are going to be three different patterns, regimes, 
that we are going to understand and be able to value a, a, a share of stock based on right? what we call a constant dividend regime, which means that the dividend is constant forever. So it is the same forever. So we have a level cash flow that goes on forever. This is just a simple perpetuity, right? So the standard perpetuity has a level cash flow that is paid forever. And so the price of a share of stock with dividends like that is is calculated by taking the present value of a, of a simple perpetuity, a normal perpetuity. Okay. Then the second regime is what we call a constant growth regime. And in a constant growth regime, the firm is paying dividends out, but the dividends are growing at a relatively constant rate. That's like what we saw with Procter & Gamble. It was growing from four cents to five cents to six cents to seven cents to eight cents. And as long as that's what we assume the firm is going to do, and that's what we have evidence the firm is trying to do, we can value a, a constantly growing dividend regime as a growing perpetuity model, where the rule is, is that they have cash flows that grow at a constant rate forever. Again, we're assuming forever here, um, but that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a bad assumption. And then the last case is where we have what's called supernormal or non-constant growth, or what I will sometimes call two-stage growth, where we allow ourselves the ability of these first two stages to commingle with each other. So we say it's possible that a firm might have different dividend regimes at different periods of time. And as long as we can identify these two different regimes and the second regime is constant or constantly growing, we can use a multi-stage model to calculate the present value of those dividends. Now, this is one of the more complicated uh, problems that will, types of problems that will work in class. Uh, so we'll jump to a quick example here uh, where I wanna talk in more detail and show you in more detail uh, what these types of dividend regimes look like and what the models that we use to price them look like.